This is the chapter on combustors and the chapter on turbines. First, the combustion section. Well, we've already covered the fact that the main purpose of combustors is to increase gas velocity. And it has been covered before, so I'm going to go over it rapidly, that you can get this rapid increase in velocity by burning fuel, that is, you're converting chemical energy into heat energy. This heat energy raises the temperature of the gases. And as you've added this energy to it in the form of heat, the molecules are going to bounce around much, much faster than they did before. And they're going to try to expand. You can't expand them towards the front of the engine because you have high pressure air coming in. You can't expand them sideways because you have the wall of the engine case. So the only place they can expand is aft towards the uh, big old hole in the back of the engine called the exhaust pipe. So since the gases can expand aft, their axial velocity or their velocity going towards the back of the engine is going to increase. Now, in addition to the fact that the combustion chamber needs to increase gas velocity, we also need, as a secondary purpose, that it be fuel efficient. We need to burn all of the fuel and extract as much energy out of it as we possibly can. The third best purpose, or tertiary purpose, is that we want to do this burning in a manner that the engine lasts as long as possible. That's what's meant by service life, is that the engine lasts a long time without having to fix it, without having to replace parts. And then the quaternary purpose, or the fourth most important purpose, is to do this burning with low emissions, that is, with producing the least amount of pollution as possible. Now, I'm not going to ask other than the primary purpose that you know the order. A test question might be, what is the primary purpose of the combustor, combustion chamber? And that's to increase gas velocity. There might be a question, can you explain the three-step process on how combustors increase gas velocity, and what are the other three purposes of a combustion chamber? I would not ask you to tell me which in order they are, other than the primary purpose is increasing gas velocity. There's four basic types of combustion chambers, can, can annular, annular through flow, and reverse annular through flow. So here's what a can type combustion chamber would look like. If you took the cowling off, you could actually see what looks like separate cans in the combustion chamber, hence the term can. Now each one of these cans is its own separate uh, combustion chamber. So let's try a different color here. For instance, there is a can on the outside. And then inside of that is another piece of metal. You can see here's the can right here. And here's the liner, so it's actually a piece of metal inside of a piece of metal. If we drew this uh, looking from the cutting across the engine, if we had our engine and here was the combustion chamber and we cut it right through the center of the engine, a can type combustion chamber would look like this. There'd be four, there'd be five, six, or seven combustion cans. We'll draw one that's got five. And then inside of that is going to be the liner. It's actually pretty darn close to the edge. I'm drawing the liner with dotted lines because the liner has holes in it. And of course the shaft of the engine, you know, the shaft of the engine coming through the middle, we'd have to see that. But if we looked at the side of the engine, I'm drawing a self-portrait. Oh wait, here we go. In any case, if we looked at the side of the engine, we'd see the cans. And inside of each of those, we'd see the flame or the combustion process going on. I'm not going to ask you to draw this on the test, but you can get my point here is that there are separate individual combustion cans, combustion containers. And we're going to get into the more of the details of the inside of the combustion can. And But of course, in each one, we're going to squirt fuel in, and it's going to squirt out the nozzle. And the nozzle is going to make a nice pattern. And 
and the reason there's holes and such is because there's going to be air coming in and air comes in these holes and air actually goes through these air comes in here so there's a lot of air coming into the combustion chamber then there's the can annular if I were to draw a can annular we'd still have the combustion liners supposed to all be the same size. And inside of it we would definitely have the combustion process going on. So again this is a cutaway if we cut the engine in half while it was running. But we need something to keep all the air in. So instead of each combustion chamber being surrounded by its own can, we're going to surround the whole thing. So if we looked at the side of the engine, well, I'll show you this here in a second. If we look, if we cut through the engine, if here's the engine, and we cut through the engine right smack in the middle while it was running, we could look at the side of the engine and we'd see this one can going all the way around, but they're separate liners on the inside. But of course we still got the shaft, so we're going to have to have something on the inside, and now we can run the shaft. So now the air, the gases can't get out. And that's a can annular. Uh, this was still popular. Nobody's making the can type anymore. The can annular was still popular uh, in the early 60s. In fact, the JT8D, JT8D, which was put on the 727s, the early 737s that had the skinny looking engines, the DC-9s, and the early MD-80 series uh, had the Pratt & Whitney JT-8D, and it was can annular. There were separate liners inside of the engine, and they were all inside of one big can. and there were flame propagation tubes. So here is they've cut away, there's actually an engine case that covered all this up and inside of it are separate cans. This one has quite a few cans and between each tube, which this doesn't show very well, between each tube, there, between each uh, liner there was a uh, flame propagation tube. Here's another one coming to the next one, flame propagation tube. So you could have an igniter coming in here and catch the flame on fire and get the flame going in here and the fuel air mixture would burn into the next can and that flame would propagate into the next can hence the term flame propagation tubes now the annular through flow certainly has the highest fuel efficiency Let's see if I can try drawing it. If we looked at the side of the engine, we'd see a can. But on the inside, instead of having several cans, there's one big can. And it's kind of like the annual rings of a tree hence the name annular and the flame goes all the way around. In fact, so if you chop this engine up while it was running it would look like you cut it up like a tree. So the flames going all the way around the engine shaft is going through the middle gases can't get out, gases can't get out, gases can't get out, gases can't get out and this is the most fuel efficient type of combustion chamber, the annular flu through flow. Here's one, this is out of an early Learjet, you don't have to write this down, but this is out of a CJ610, which is the same thing as a military J85, and the fuel nozzles were on this end, and you see that there's the outer case, and there is 
an inner case so the gases can't get out and on the inside you can see the liner and of course you can see the fact that there's a lot of holes in it because air again some of the air is going to go in and get burned up but we're still going to have to have air come in later for cooling purposes before we get to the turbine section which is back here here's a different perspective this is out of uh, the Traeger and this is on a CF6 a very popular high bypass turbofan and here's a cutaway uh, if we had the engine shaft going through here there'd be a uh, another uh, combustion chamber up here so we're just looking at one and of course this goes all the way around but you'll notice here there's just one whoops here's the fuel gets squirted out we're gonna have a nice flame pattern but the exact same engine different combustion chamber they get this one has two flames going on and this one has two flames going on so there are some modern transport category jet uh, turbine high bypass turbo fan turbine engines where they have more than one flame pattern going on all the way around and here is the Pratt & Whitney JT9D figure 5-21 out of the Traeger and of course it was in the Boeing 747-100 that came out in 1969 and you can see how small the combustion chamber is you know we're talking flame pattern right here going all the way around it has an annular through flow combustion chamber because this combustion chamber goes all the way around Then uh, the fourth one, a type of combustion chamber, which is still in production. Uh, not too many can annulars out there. It's mostly annular and annular reverse flow. And here I'll show you a picture. The uh, tire prop in the classroom, the cutaway of the turbo prop, has a can annular reverse uh, correction, reverse annular through flow. And just for fun, I'm going to draw in here. Here it ha just happens to have, it doesn't have to, but it just happens to have a two-stage uh, compressor. So we probably have about 15 to 1 compression across the entire compressor. And you can see the airflow here. Airflow comes in, gets flung outward, and goes back into the second stage. And here's what gets weird is the air comes down in the combustion chamber and makes a 180 degree turn and this is where the fuel gets squirted in. The fuel gets squirted in and here's where the flame is. So our rapid increase in velocity is actually in the opposite direction of the engine, hence the term annular reverse. So this is annular reverse. And so the air gets accelerated towards the front of the engine, but then it makes another 180 degree turn. And this doesn't show it very well, but this t particular engine has three turbines. And so the air finally goes through the turbines and out the exhaust. Now, you got to understand that the shorter we make this engine, it gives us a couple of advantages. First of all, this uh, shaft inside of the engine, the shaft inside of the engine, we got to have the shaft going on here just to run the engine of course and we also got a hash shaft coming out and going to all our gears you know so we can drive that propeller way out in the front but if we spread this out if we spread it out so the turbines were way out down here then we would have more engine shaft and the longer it is the more it's going to tend to torsion or twist we're going to have to make it bigger it's going to weigh more so by making a sh an annular reverse uh, combustion chamber we can reduce the length of the engine and reduce the length of the shaft. We can cut out maybe a foot in here. So that saves us weight. Also, the thing I like about it is the fact that if these turbine blades break apart, they've got to go through one, two, three, four different layers of metal 
before they can exit the engine. Of course, they can always break off and blow out the tailpipe. But I'm worried about it if it's on the side of the airplane and this is coming into the cabin, you know, where the windows are, and I'm sitting right here. Then I'm really unhappy. That would be an uncontained failure. An uncontained failure on a jet engine is where some of the parts come flying out of the side of the engine. A contained failure means it breaks, but nothing comes flying out the side. So here I like this because there's more metal parts. Here is another engine. This is a TPE 731. You don't have to write this down. TP 731, it's a turbo fan. You can actually see, here's the duct here. Here's the duct here. You can see the main engine shaft is right here. Try a different color here. And you notice there's a shaft coming out running a gearbox, and this has another shaft going over here to run a gearbox. So the, uh, the cowling might go like this. and we've got some airflow. Here's our bypass airflow and the engine, the core airflow is rather interesting. I'm not going to ask you to do this, but here's uh, of course we have the fan which is at one stage of compression and then we have what have it looks like one, two, three, four uh, stages of axial compression and then right here is a centrifugal compressor so 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2 for the four uh, axial compressor stages times 6 would tell us approximately what the uh, compression ratio of this compressor is. And then, here's the airflow. I'll just keep doing it in blue. The air comes out, makes a 180 degree turn. This is where the combustion takes place. You can make that noise right now if you want to. And the air makes another 180 after a high velocity. And it looks like here's one, two, three uh, turbine blades. Although, no, wait, looks like there's one right here. So I can't tell if this is a two spool engine or not. I don't think it is, but it might be. In any case, it's another example of a reverse annular combustion chamber. Now let's take a peek. Um, you got to understand something. Jet fuel does not catch on fire unless it's in a vaporous state. The fuel has to evaporate. And it doesn't go BAM and explode in an instant. It actually takes time. The reason why you need a low axial velocity during burn is you need time for the fuel to burn. So if here's our turbine engine and we've got this combustion chamber. If it stays at a really high speed, it won't get all burned by the time it gets to the end of here, and it's going to go through the turbine section, and it's still going to be on fire, so these hot temperatures will affect our turbine blades. Typically, the flame gets, you, gets burned up during about the first third of the combustion chamber, and then we just bring in cold air to mix with it. Obviously we've got to burn some air. We're going to bring some cold air to mix with it so that by the time it gets to the turbines it's cooled down. It's still hot but it's cooler than it was. So what we need to have occur during this first third is we need to slow the air velocity down. So here's a picture. It looks like a can annular type doesn't make much difference. This doesn't show it very well, but there's usually some swirlers right here, so the air comes in and gets swirled. So this air right here is swirling. And of course you can see that if the air comes in these holes and turns sideways, its axial velocity at this moment is pretty much zero. So the time it takes to go from here to here, this has been slowed down. Now it's cool because we're, if, until we start burning the fuel, Bernoulli's theorem will work. If we reduce the pressure, the, pr the velocity, the pressure will go up. So you can get, you'll notice here, look at this right here. We actually have a slightly diverging duct. Diverge. 
and so the pressure does go down I mean the velocity does go down so the pressure goes up a little bit and so we're going to give it time because we need time for the fuel to burn and then of course in here velocity is going to pick back up to higher than it was before and of course we'll take a look at the pressure velocity and temperature this is figure 13-7-3-17b rather in the Traeger 3-17b and you'll notice that the lowest velocity in the engine is right as we're entering the combustion chamber so here we got the fuel nozzle and here the fuel is burning in our nice spray pattern here and that's where the velocity is at its lowest and of course gases can't expand sideways they can't expand upstream against this high pressure air so they can expand aft so the velocity is going to go way up of course this is due to the fact that the temperature that the temperature is going to rise quite a bit and of course it's the Brayton cycle we want to convert as much of this energy into velocity as possible so we don't want to trade off pressure for it so we're going to say that pressure is relatively constant doesn't change very much yeah pressure velocity temperature got it and of course I've covered this in class before that 30 percent of the core air is burning combustion this is these are approximate numbers generic numbers you can apply generically or typically to most any jet engine here's a different uh, can type combustion chamber and here's the swirler the air is going to come in and get swirled here's the combustion air it's going to burn get burned during approximately the first third is where the burning is going to happen and we're going to bring in cooling air all over the place of course we're going to have to burn some air but you know what we're going to start mixing it right away we've got air coming in Man, we should, I could make a comic book stay between the lines and in fact this interestingly enough this diagram here 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent is 30 percent now this says it calls it dilution air but we're going to call it cooling air because I'm writing the test so you gotta write down the answer I want so we're gonna keep allowing air to come in here so that the temperature ends up getting cooler and cooler and cooler so by the time we get to the turbines it's not as hot now what's gonna happen is here right smack inside of this flame in here for generic test purposes we're going to say it's 2,000 degrees Celsius. That's really stinking hot. And then when we talk about the turbine section, we're going to say that this cooling reduces it. So if we got a turbine blade out here, that by the time the gases get into the turbine section, it's actually cooled down to 1,000 degrees Celsius significantly. That's quite a bit of change in temperature. Stoichiometric, stoichiometric. The stoichiometric ratio, you probably heard of this because it's on uh, piston engines as well, is that ratio of air where you burn all the fuel and burn all the gasoline. Well, inside of a piston engine, all the air and fuel that comes in it that's in here, we want to burn 100% of the oxygen and 100% of the fuel. In a jet engine, we don't have to do that. We can use a lot of that air for cooling. Just like in a piston engine, if you enrich in it, and so there's extra fuel, it'll burn cooler because you put in extra fuel. We don't want to burn extra fuel. We want to uh, pull more air in. Uh, but inside of that core, inside of that uh, combustion chamber, inside of that combustion chamber, the air that gets burned, this 30% that gets burned that is 15 pounds of air for every one pound of fuel now this is weight this is weight this is not volume this is not pressure this is mass if you will so we're all those hydrocarbons in the fuel are going to take a lot of 
air, a lot of oxygen to burn. Now, of course, this is 15 pounds of air, and of course, oxygen is only 21% of that. But I'll be happy if you can remember 30% is burned, and 70% of the air going in here is for cooling. And this 30% that's burned, that's the part that applies to the 15 to 1 ratio is only the 30 percent burned. So if we just look at a regular turbojet, air going through it, through the core anyway, 30 percent is burned, 70 percent is for cooling. If we now put some extra turbines on it and extracted, extracted the energy to drive a fan, and let's just say that we had a 5 to 1 bypass ratio, then now we're taking a lot more air and running through the bypass that's not even counted in the core air. So the vast majority of air that goes through a jet engine is doesn't get messed with at all other than we increase the pressure and we increase the velocity. And this is figure 3-50 out of the Traeger. And this is velocity across the bottom here. And you'll see that we could run the engine with a 30 to 1 ratio. This would be 30, 30 pounds of air to 30 pounds of fuel. Or we could run it all the way at 5 to 1, 5 pounds of air for every 1 pound of fuel. But we'd have to slow the air down, the velocity down here compared to the velocity up here. So guess what? We want we don't want to have to slow the air down. So we want to be able to run it at as fast a velocity as we can so we can get a lot of air through the engine. So we're going to typically run jet engines at about 15 to 1 air to fuel ratio so we can let the gases go fast through the engine. And I already got that 2000 degrees Celsius. Okay, in general and almost all the time the hotter the temperatures inside of the combustion section, that is, the hotter you're burning the fuel at, therefore the less cooling air, the less pollution your engine is putting out. Emissions, in this case, I guess you could say emissions are twofold. One, pollution, and two is, is noise. But right now I'm talking about pollution. In particular, um, let's see, in particular, smoke, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and of course my personal favorite, nitrogen oxides. Now watch out, these nitrogen oxides are not the same NO2 or nitrous oxide that you get at the dentist or you put into your car to make it go faster. That is a different nitrogen oxide. Um, these are all not good. As you can see, here are the uh, different types of noxious chemicals coming out of the engine and here are the atmospheric effects. Um, I'm not going to ask you to say smoke causes visible smog or carbon dioxide causes global warming. I would just be really happy if on the test you would realize and be able to tell me, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Name, name six of the five different uh, harmful chemicals that come out of a jet engine and here one two three four that one's a repeat five Wait, one two three yeah name six of the five different negative atmospheric effects and I'm not gonna say that you have to say oh this one does that one but this way I'll have a clear understanding that you have a reasonable understanding that jet engines uh, create pollution and that there are negative consequences to that pollution if you have any questions about combustors, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to have made this lecture better, please get a hold of me then too. Thank you. The turbine section. Of course, we already know that the primary purpose of the turbine section is to extract energy to drive the compressor, and that in addition to you know running the engine, we got to develop thrust, and unless we're a turbojet, which nobody makes anymore, we're going to need to extract energy to drive the output shaft on a turbo shaft, the fan on a turbofan, or the propeller on a turboprop. Um, 
we also know that we've got to drive the hydraulic pump, a fuel pump, an electrical generator, stuff like that. So there's a third purpose, a tertiary purpose. And I'm going to add another one, is that we have to extract enough energy to drive the compressor, not only so the compressor can uh, help us you know, compress the air so the engine will run, but oops, but that it'll also produce enough uh, compressed air that we can use it for the airframe. We can use this air to pressurize the airplane is probably the most important or certainly uses the most energy off of the compressor, uh, but you can use it for airframe anti icing, take that hot air and run it across the leading edges of the airfoils. And I don't care if you know what the uh, order is, other than the primary is to run the compressor. Uh, but after that, we got to extract energy to run the prop sha shaft or fan. We got to drive the accessory section. And we need uh, bleed air for the airframe. And so we're going to have to compress even more energy there. So if we had to go and look at these numbers at the bottom of the slide, the 66% that is to drive the compressor so that the engine will run. And this 28% is to develop energy to provide thrust or shaft horsepower on our turboprop, our fan, or our shaft. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous class, we're going to use this 1% of the uh, fuel energy is to drive the accessory section and even more than that is this bleed air. We're going to say that 2% is for bleed air for airframe use and most of that is for pressurizing the airplane. And then this 3% that's what gets blown out the tailpipe. Remember if we have a jet engine no matter what kind of jet engine it is, of course we're going to just talk about turboprop, turboshafts, or turbo fans. Say we got a propeller out here with our box. Then we're, we are going to blow out 3% of the energy that was burned in the tailpipe. We're not going to extract it. So you could say that this turbine section is going to extract, and these are generic numbers, but they work pretty good for the test. The turbine section is going to extract 97% of the energy going through it. And of course, here is that 97% is going to be used to run the compressor so we can run the engine, is to run the prop, the, shan or the prop, the shaft, or the fan. We're going to take bleed air off of the compressor so we can run airframe systems like the pressurization system. And then 1% of that fuel energy is going to run the accessory section, and that leaves 3% of the fuel energy left that we're going to blow out the tailpipe. Okay, there's two basic types of turbines. The first one is a radial inflow turbine, or turbine, if you prefer. I looked it up. Both pronunciations are correct. But unlike a a uh, centrifugal compressor where the air comes in the eye and gets flowing out sideways, we're actually going to blow the air in from the side and it's going to come out the eye. So that's the airflow if you look at it from the side. And here's a nice picture. You'll notice these stationary blades right here is a convergent duct. It gets smaller. So as the air goes through here, the velocity, just like sticking your finger over a water faucet, velocity is going to go up. And since there's no uh, adding or subtracting of energy, we don't let any air in out from the beginning of this duct to the end of it. Uh, it's a close energy system, so Bernoulli's law applies. So if we change one kind of energy, we're going to have to, in one direction, we're going to have to change the other in the opposite direction. So static pressure goes down, but velocity goes up. So the velocity is going to hit this wheel and come out. And of course, therefore, this uh, radial inflow turbine is going to spin. Now the downside to radial inflow turbines, well, the good side is they don't weigh very much. 
That's their biggest advantage, is that they don't weigh very much. The downside is that they're not efficient at extracting energy. So you're not going to ever find a radial inflow turbine on an aircraft that, correction, on an engine that's propelling the aircraft. With a turbo, even a turboshaft engine on a helicopter that's being used to propel the aircraft is not going to have a radial inflow turbine. The only time you're ever going to find radial inflow turbine is on some APUs. Like I said before, APUs are turboshaft engines, and APUs, you hardly ever run them in flight, so having a low weight APU is more important than a low TSFC or a low fuel burning APU. So there will, you might find a few APUs that have a radial inflow turbine. The vast majority of turbines that you see on airplanes are going to be axial flow turbines. Got some compressors and combustion chambers. And what you're going to see in a turbine section is stationary blades. And then you're going to see the rotating blades. So this here is a stationary blade and this is a rotating blade. And just like the radial inflow turbine, the stationary blades are going to be set up to be a convergent duct. And so the velocity is going to get kicked up and the pressure is going to go down. And then the rotating blade, that's where the energy is going to be extracted. So one stage is the stationary blades in front of the rotating blades and the rotating blades. The stationary blades are often called turbine inlet guide vanes. You might also call them a turbine nozzle since they uh, increase the velocity and you could also call them guide vanes. I got a picture here. I'm going to show you that picture one of these days. Here we go. Here's the stationary blades. and here's the rotating blades and you'll notice that this distance right here as the airflow goes through the stationary blades and whacks whacks the uh, rotating blades you notice that this distance right here versus this distance right here it gets smaller so as it goes through these the, this is the turbine nozzle right here you know check it out here's the nozzle so velocity is going to go up, pressure is going to go down. So the air hitting the rotating blade is at its highest speed possible. You probably don't remember this. Force equals mass times acceleration. In this case, the force hitting the blade is equal to the mass of the air times the uh, negative acceleration. So force is going to leave or be subtracted out of the air and added to the rotating blade. Okay, we got stationary guide vanes, increases velocity, but the pressure will go down. And of course, it controls the angle of the air going into the rotating blades as well. So the air coming through hits it just at the right angle. And of course, we got the rotating blades extract the energy and makes the shaft spin. And of course, since uh, it's taking energy out of the airflow, we don't have to have, uh, it's not complying with Bernoulli's theorem, so we can actually have a reduction in velocity, a reduction in pressure, and a reduction in temperature as the airflow goes through the rotating blade. And here's figure 3-17B, which you've seen before, and here's the turbine section. So here's the compressor, this is the compressor section, this is the combustor, and then here's the turbine blades, I'll do a close up here. So here's the turbine blades down here on the bottom. And here's the stator, and here's the rotor. And of course in the stator, here's the velocity. 
we have the lowest velocity in the turbine section in the combustor velocity goes up because we heated it up here's the entry level velocity entering the turbine section and of course we're going to use that nozzle that turbine nozzle to kick the velocity way up and then we're going to use the rotating blade to suck the energy back off now me personally uh, they don't do a very good job here if the velocity goes up then I would have thought that this pressure would have gone down but uh, you know I, I guess I'll have to send them a letter and then the next station stationary blade or turbine inlet guide vane or got, uh, increases the velocity the pressure ought to go down and then we're going to extract velocity and of course the pressure and the temperature go down as well in the rotor and this keeps occurring now what I find rather interesting is that this is a turboprop engine doesn't show it very well but there's actually a gearbox out here and a propeller so we've got an extra turbine or two in here to extract energy to drive that um, but what's interesting is that the exit velocity right here is slightly higher than the velocity entering the turbine section so you could actually say from one perspective that the turbine section uh, the velocity the average velocity is increased because we've jacked it up so much so the entering velocity to the turbine section is actually lower than the exit velocity or you could say well you know what once we get the velocity to its highest point possible in the engine we're going to extract energy out of it so the velocity goes down once we've brought it way way up so you could say that the lowest velocity in the engine is right at the beginning of the combustion chamber the highest velocity in the engine is after it goes through the first stator and once it gets to that point then the velocity goes down well you could say that okay characteristics of turbine sections um, typically the gas is hitting that turbine inlet guide vane or a thousand degrees Celsius so I'll put in my first whoops my first yeah here we go put in the put in the stationary blades the gases that hit right there are at about a thousand degrees Celsius of course that's a generic number but this is typically the typically nothing this is where the hottest gases hit metal you know inside of the combustion chamber we're gonna run cooling air in here so that the flame can't hit the uh, the liner inside the engine but sooner or later we're gonna have to have hot gases hitting metal so we can extract energy out of it however we can help with that by taking bleed air off of the rest of the engine and routing it to the compre the turbine section so we can actually have an engine core here with our compressor blades and I have a little duct coming out of the compressor and we've got this bleed air now granted it may be 200 to 400 degrees Celsius based on how fast how high the power setting or where we take the bleeder off if we take it up closer to the front it'll be colder but it won't be as high a pressure and we can run this through a duct and then blow it through the stationary blades and we can actually blow it into the turbine blades and here I'll show you here are some uh, stationary guide vanes some jet turbine inlet guide vanes some turbine nozzles and if we run in bleed air down the center of, of this blade down the hollow blade then some is going to come out the leading edge and get blown around some's going to come out here and this air down in here is going to travel on the inside and blow out here so we're actually keeping this cool now granted like I said 200 to 400 degrees Celsius air but compared to the 1000 degree air that's hitting it uh, this will keep the metal from getting too hot so the question is why bleed air cooling and that's a really great question so let's see if we have a 
typical jet engine core. And I'm not going to draw the uh, stationary blades. And these gases hitting the turbine section are at a thousand degrees Celsius. If we could make the metal here uh, withstand higher temperature, then or we could cool it down better with bleed air, so that instead of a thousand degrees Celsius, we could let it run at say 1,200 degrees Celsius. Then that means the amount of air coming through the engine for cooling, we don't need as much. So what we could do then is make the compressor smaller. We wouldn't need as big of a compressor because we wouldn't need as much cooling air. If we don't need as much cooling air, then more of the energy from these turbines can be extracted instead of to run a big compressor, to run a bigger propeller or a fan or a shaft so we could get more thrust or more power. So effectively, if we have higher temps hitting the uh, turbine section. That's going to lead to uh, less cooling air needed. And if we have less cooling air, then, then we can have a smaller compressor. If we have a smaller compressor, then we can have a higher percentage of fuel. Used for thrust or shaft horsepower. So there's a very good incentive here. Oh wait, and guess what? If a higher percentage of fuel is used for thrust or shaft horsepower, then that's going to lead to a lower TSFC. Yay! So there's a big incentive there to have engines that can handle a higher temperature. And so if we can run bleed air through these blades so they can handle a higher temperature, then definitely it's going to get done. So that's the why bleed air cooled. Thermocase cooling. All right. Let me talk about turbine case cooling. How many jet engine stick diagrams am I going to draw in one semester? A bunch. Got to draw this nice and accurate. Okay, we got gases leaving the combustion chamber, and the turbines are going to extract energy to drive the compressor and drive a fan or whatever else we got out in the front. Now, if some of these gases go past the turbine, now granted, we'll get some thrust, but we don't want thrust from high velocity, we want thrust from low velocity. Or we want an output shaft to drive the propeller, or we need, the out, uh, we need an output shaft on a turbo shaft engine to drive a helicopter transmission or a, on an APU, an electrical generator. So this letting the air out through the exhaust isn't giving us what we want. Instead of getting 3%, maybe 3.5% of the fuel energy burned is going out the tailpipe. So what you're going to see, let's see if I can do this, oops, darn it, put these things back in, but what you need to understand that the vast majority of the time 
the engine is at cruise power setting. Yeah, we've got to take off, we've got to land at really high or really low power settings, and we might have a different power setting during climb and descent, but the majority of the time it's at cruise power. Well, if we take some of this bleed air off of the compressor and route it back, but instead of pumping it down inside of the turbine section, we may still, we'll still do that, but we put a bunch of little tubes around the outside of the turbine case. And we blow this cooler air, you know, granted, 200 to 400 degree Fahrenheit or Celsius air uh, isn't cold by human standards, but it's cold by turbine engine turbine standards. If we route this air through these tubes, then the diameter here is going to shrink. So this is going to come down a little tiny bit. This is going to come up a little tiny bit. So now there's less of a gap, less air can get through. And shucks, we may be able to go to 2.8 percent of the energy coming out is coming out the tailpipe because we've prevented the air from leaving without going through the turbines, the turbines, so we can extract that energy. So what you're going to find is that on some big transport category jet turbine engines, and here's a picture of an RB211, and I'll blow it up here a little bit on the turbine section, as you can see. the ends of these tubes. And it doesn't show it, but if you take bleed air off of one of the compressors and blow through here, then this turbine case is going to contract. And now as the air, here's the combustion chamber, as the air goes through it, it's going to have to go through the turbine and it can't escape without getting energy extracted. So that's going to improve our TSFC and it's done on some transport category jet engines and it's only there during to be it's only operated during cruise power settings. You need to understand something about jet engines is that in that turbine section the uh, stationary blades and the rotating blades, they're all fixed pitch blades. That is, the blades do not change pitch, just like in a 172. So the angle that the air is hitting them, the velocity that the air is hitting them, has to be optimized. And guess what? Since the engine is going to be a cruise power setting, they're going to optimize it for a cruise RPM setting so that the airflow going through it is at the right velocity, the right angle. To, to extract the right amount, the most amount of energy, and instead of saying near redline, we're going to say 90 to 95 percent, and that equals a cruise RPM. Now watch out, that is not cruise power. You may recall for thrust versus engine RPM, starting out at zero. See how well I can draw. And here's at 90%. And here's at 100. That uh, at 90% power, correction, at 90% RPM, we might only be at 80% power. But since that's where we're going to run the engine most of the time, then they're going to set these blades up to be optimum at that. It's not that you can't run it slower, and it's not that you can't run it faster, but your TSFC won't be as good. So your TSFC at cruise will be the lowest. It's going to give us the lowest TSFC. And so therefore, if we're running at takeoff power or we're running at idle, TSFC won't be as low because the blade angles aren't as good as they need to be. There is no turbine engine I have ever seen where the rotating blades, either in the compressor or in the turbine section, had uh, variable pitch blades. I've never seen the rotating blades in a mass-produced turbine engine have variable pitch. Okay, larger areas. Here's the Pratt Whitney JT9D came off of the 747-100 back in 1969, I think it went into service. You notice these turbine blades right here, they got bigger. 
it's because the first turbine blades, you know, they're extracting velocity, they're extracting pressure, their temperature's going down. So if we want to keep getting a decent amount of energy as the air goes through the turbine blades, we need a larger area because the area is going to be hit by a smaller velocity, the area is going to be hit by a smaller pressure. So to continue extracting energy, you're going to see turbine engines where the area of the blades, or you could say the cross-section of the turbines, the area, area of the turbine gets bigger. And I already covered this part about the exhaust velocity. About here's Here's the velocity entering the turbine section, here's the velocity exiting the turbine section, and the fact that since we jack the velocity up with our stators, that's going to allow us to extract a lot of energy out of it, but still, the velocity leaving the engine is a little bit higher than the velocity leaving the combustion chamber.